31st August 2021, I posted a digital fashion show on my Instagram and website. We had no budget, no marketing team. In ways somehow I still don't understand yet today, it went viral worldwide and turned me into a human rights activist overnight. Not even in my wildest dreams can I imagine all the amazing things I've been lucky enough to experience, all thanks to that one fashion show. But when no one knew it was, less than two months before that happened, I was about to end my life, right before I came up with the idea of the show that changed my entire life. I was born in China, into an academic and artistic family. My grandparents on my father's side are what you would call the old money. In generations, we own lands and banks, till everything was taken away from us during the Cultural Revolution in China. Many fled the country. My father stayed. And I grew up in a very humble home without experiencing any luxury or comfort. I was a really happy kid, though. Always lived in my imaginary fairy tale land. I was always home painting. And on the rare occasion of me going out, my favorite thing to do was hunting after butterflies and fireflies. I've been searching for beauty in life and nature and birth art for as long as I can remember. After my parents' terrible divorce, me and my mom moved to a small town in South Sweden when I was 10. In that small village in the middle of the forest, no one looked like me. Growing up in Sweden, I never felt like I belonged. I spent my first years really ashamed of my Chinese identity. All I wanted to do was just to blend in and be like all the other kids. I remember how I used to pretend I don't speak Chinese just so kids in my class would stop making fun of me. And it doesn't matter how well Swedish I spoke, my face will always tell I was different. And then I found fashion as my escape when I became a teenager. It was fascinating to me how some piece of cheap cloth can give me a whole new identity and self-expression. I started a blog at the time everyone had a blog. In school, in my home, I was a nobody. In the pictures and online, I was someone cool and fashionable. I moved to Stockholm right after high school, and I worked two part-time jobs, trying to make a living while trying so hard to get a foot in the fashion industry. I remember how I used to one moment mopping the toilet floor in the sushi restaurant I worked in and then change to a fashionable outfit and jump right to the free fashion shoot. Or how I used to drink champagne in the fancy fashion party after eight hours long club pass in the subway booth selling subway tickets. I started to give invites for fashion shows and fashion weeks. Underneath all the glamour, something else was going on entirely. Due to complicated relationship with my family, childhood trauma, and things that happened to me was when I was a teenager. I was suffering with depression, eating disorder, self-harm, and suicide attempts. And instead of doing something about it, well, I would try so hard to become someone successful, not knowing what that will be. I got a job in Prada and learned the world of luxury fashion. And I really tried to have, find my happiness within it and became a shopaholic. At some point, I was buying something new every single day. Now knowing my unconscious way of shopping was just a way to fill my empty wine deep down in my heart. After two years in Prada, I finally decided to quit. I was totally burned out. I desperately needed to start over. In my first year, I was stuck in Japan due to the pandemic. It was like... All of a sudden, the world stopped. During my spare time, I listened to over 100 audiobooks that summer. I went through everything from psychology to philosophy, culture to history, even science and religion. I desperately wanted to find out what's the meaning of life. And the more I learned, the more I understood I knew nothing. I spent hours and hours walking the parks in Japan. And it was like all these years I've been swimming in the ocean full of waves, trying so hard to have my head above the water, seconds from drowning all the time. I couldn't see the beauty of the ocean I was surrounded in. And now the world stops, 
I can finally breathe again and open my eyes to see the beauty in nature and art, just like I did when I was a little kid. Beauty, art, and culture, that was what I was surrounding in Japan. And I also started to learn about haute couture. Haute couture, a French word of the highest quality of fashion and handcraft. And it really spoke to me. Fashion is so much more than just some piece of cloth. Fashion is our form, and art is a mirror of life. Fashion tells stories about the people of its time and place. That leads me to question, what is fast fashion telling about our priorities and moral values of our society? Because we do not just have fast fashion, we also have fast food, fast relationship. It's so much cheaper and easier to throw something away when it gets broken than fixing it. Also because what we have from the first beginning was so little value to us. I was so ashamed of myself when I realized how my unconscious way of shopping actually contributed to a lot. Mass consumption leads to mass production. As a result, to keep the high demand of cheap goods, brand has to source the cheapest way possible to keep their profit. The tragic irony is that, well, the products we consume then later ends up in the landfill destroying the environment when they are being made by tears and blood of people who got paid below minimum wage. I was so sure that if I was going to work in the industry that had caused so much harm to the environment, I have to do it in the way that contributes to positive change instead. That's how I came up with the idea of Scandinavia's first rental-only, non-sell cultural brand. It was nothing just a humble attempt to inspire a different way to consume and produce clothes. Normally, people who work in couture have many, many years of experience in the, the highest class in tailoring, and my education in fashion was just limited to, to base class in pattern when I was in high school. The good thing, though, that I was self-taught and didn't have graduated from a fashion school was I didn't know the rules, so I can come up with my new ones to create fashion in different ways. And since my idea was not to sell, I wanted to create dresses that could fit every woman regardless of size and shape. My favorite one so far is this petrol blue one made by actually curtains. And it became a favorite among actresses and red carpets and politicians of noble banquet and supermodels alike. It was fascinating to see how different every woman looked in it. The most significant thing I learned during my time in Japan was, according to BBC, UN reports, and various news outlets, 1 to 1.8 million Uyghur Muslims and other Turkey ethnicity groups are locked up in concentration camps and forced labor camps in Uyghur region in China. One in five cotton governments in the world are tamed with the Uyghur forced labor. Not only is the world turning the blind eye to this tragic crime, we are even profiting from it. Many of us are unconsciously supporting it by buying goods obtained by forced labor. As a fashion designer, I felt it was my duty to do something about it. At the time, I couldn't find one single article from any well-known fashion magazine talking about this, even though the direct link between the fashion industry and the forced labor. When I came back to Sweden, I did a research about it for almost a year, and I came, back, came into contact with the Swedish Uyghur family. The beautiful story and face changed me. In the business and the fashion world, many people who already had everything did everything they could to gain more, regardless if it means to hurt someone in the process. But they already lost everything, but never wanted to have anything from me. On the contrast, they invited me to their home, opened their arms to me, and treated me like a family, even though my people, well, my government to be exact, are the very reason they lost everything from the first place. And when they told me that I was the first Han Chinese they knew who reached out to want to help, I made myself a promise that I would never stop helping them. Summer 2021, my life went upside down. I got divorced from my husband. I got problems with my business partners. And on top of that, 
I also cut ties with my family. One night, I was in so much pain, I could, I don't want to live anymore. I was about to give up. What was the point? I've been fighting so hard ever since I was a teenager. And then I remembered, I made a Uyghurs a promise. I've been so ashamed during this time, I haven't been helping them at all. And whatever I was going through, what they were going through were a million times worse. Everyone was telling me, don't talk about politics, don't mix that with passion, that would destroy your entire career. But I had nothing more to lose, and I came up with that idea, that very moment, well, I'm going to make a fashion show advocate about human rights. Normally, it takes 300 hours to make one dress. I woke up 3 a.m. every morning, and I was sewing to 10 p.m. every night. And during one and a half month, I made 10 dresses, and I reached out to my models and photographer friends and asked for help. It was the absolute most magical period of time. It turned out my friends all came from different backgrounds, and many of them also came from countries suffering through war and conflicts. So I asked them, what do you guys want to advocate for? And together, we were painting signs just days before the fashion show took place. 31st August 2021, I posted fashion show on my Instagram and website. Five minutes after the show came out, people cried and called me. Vogue Scandinavia wrote an article saying, Louis seems changing the world one dress at a time. It went viral in the ways I couldn't imagine, and it changed my life into a course I was never planned. I barely know politics or what an activist does at all. One month later, I was honored to receive the first edition of Fabric of Life Award, and ever since, I've been traveling around the world, meeting with people, everyone from forced labor survivors, camp survivors, child survivors, to billionaires and decision makers in every industry and fields. I was lucky enough to do lectures and participate in gallery and museum and luxury mall exhibitions. And last year, I also got selected as the first person from Sweden in the fashion industry as a Sakato Fellow and spoke in front of the European Parliament. When magazine all around the world in more than 10 languages was speaking about the show and everybody was congratulating me about the huge success, what no one knew was I had seven euros on my bank account. I had no idea how to survive next. I had no idea how to afford food or rent. I took a print screen of my bank account to always remind myself no one gets to tell me or anyone in this world, you're too small to make a change and you shouldn't help anyone to your thriving yourself because my story is a living proof that how that is not true. I've been spending my entire life trying to figure out the meaning of life and finally using my passion to serve others and stand up for human rights saved me. I still struggle with a lot of things every single day but at least now I know, as long as you have your purpose, all the circumstances are bearable. As long as you know your why, the how will always find its way. My favorite poet Rumi said, yesterday I was clever. I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise. I'm changing myself. Alone, nobody can change the world. But we can all become a better version of ourselves and define our passion and talents and use it to make the world a better place. Thank you.